Next up, of course, is the one and only Jamie Ian Swiss. A little, a little piece we're gonna, he's calling Credit the Con Man. Here's his haiku. Jamie Ian Swiss, sorry we were setting up. I have no haiku. Please welcome to the stage the one and only Jamie Ian Swiss. Thank you, George. Good morning. So to begin with, I asked a friend of mine, Amy. Amy, come on up. Uh, come on, it'll be fun. Uh, right over here, Ben. Uh, to help me out, and she doesn't know what we're doing, there's no prearrangement or whatever. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna show you this little game, we'll begin by showing you this little game that uh, we play on the streets of New York to welcome uh, visitors. Uh, don't get ahead of me. So um, it's a little game played with, uh, now they've been playing this game for 150 years and nobody's won yet, but hey, this could be your lucky day. Um, now, they used to play this game uh, in the early days, in the mid-19th century, uh, in uh, you know, posh surroundings, much like these, uh, in the luxury railroad, railroad cars and uh, uh, Mississippi River boats and things like that, where gamblers, hustlers, con men came to fleece the wealthy. Right? Sounds like a board game. Um, and they played it with three cards. A red card, and you're gonna pay attention to what we're doing here, another red card, and a black card. The cards were bent a little bit lengthwise to facilitate handling them on a hard surface. Okay. And the idea was to um, mix these cards around so that you could find the black card. The idea was to find the black card. Okay. Now, uh, it was a simpler time, a slower time. Were you able to follow the, red, the black card over here? Uh, you, you, I mean, it's, it's pretty easy, but it, again, it's the old days, right? Now, by the turn, the turn of the century, the game kind of fell away, pretty much vanished, except for the you know, dusty roadside carnivals and things like that, until the year 1973, when the game came back to a place uh, that at least one expert has called the Monte Capital of the world, my hometown, New York City. And they made a couple, no, I'm a real New Yorker, sir. I, I don't care where you're from. Uh, so. And, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and they made a couple of changes. Now gone with a posh surroundings. Uh, they played the, card on a, played the game now on a street corner on a stack of cardboard boxes, right? They also made a little change with the game itself because now they use a black card, a red card, and another black card. <laughs> and uh, thanks for paying attention. And no, save it up. I got a weak finish. And, um, and uh, the game is often accompanied now by a running commentary delivered in the colorful patois for which the region is so noted. Ready? Okay. Here's a game if you want to make money. Five and get you 10, 10 and get you 20. 20 get you 40, 40 get you 80. 80 get you my old lady, but she's too fat. Red card moves like a snake in the grass. Sometimes slow and sometimes fast. Now, did you see the red card fall over here? No, I think it's in the center. No, you gotta trust me. I'm trying to explain the game to you, okay? <laughs> So, okay, and could you do me a favor? I didn't tape this up, so could you just kind of steady that for me? Thank you, Donald. Uh, okay, no, I'm trying to explain to you how it works, okay? Now, a lot of people know that Monty is a hustle, but they don't know exactly how the hustle works. For example, I've very, I've very often heard it theorized that the money card, the red card, is never on the table, that it goes away, that all these cards would be the same because that card's black and that card's black and that card's black. And it's true, all these cards are exactly the same, uh, Except for this one. This one is always there. It's, it's, that's, a, that's a myth. It's always there. It's actually always there. That's, that, much is, that much is true. Now, I've seen some incredibly bold maneuvers. You really, you know, they say this is a one in three chance. It's actually a game of no chance. The only way that you have a one in three chance is if you close your eyes. The moment you look, no chance. So uh, Monty operator says, this ain't no guess. It's just an eye test. But the fact of the matter is, even here's an extreme example for demonstration purposes only. Let's say by pure chance, I won't touch it again, right? Let's say by pure chance, you actually pick the right card. You might kind of call this moron, Monty. <laughs> and now accidentally, or somehow, you've pointed to the right card, right? Well, I've actually seen a Monty operator go, no, it's not over there, it's over there. And you know, who are you gonna complain to, right? So, Department of Consumer Affairs. So, uh, now, today they play in Monty, what they call Monty mobs. And an important part of the game is the shills, the Confederates. And they're there uh, for all kinds of psychological reasons and to help you 
uh, to help to convince the mark, the victims, the uh, uh, viewers, uh, not only that the game is uh, real, they're the people who, who win. Anytime you see somebody win, they're playing with the house's money, but also they lose strategically as well. Okay, now, uh, but because they play in mobs, sometimes multiple games on the same block, and then you've got wall men, the security, the muscle, and this and that, and there might be 12, 14 people on the block, you literally take your life in your hands today. I don't recommend you ever try this game at all. They're not going to pay you, and they might just hurt you. They'll just as soon hit you upside the head and take the wallet and run. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I have taken a Monty operator for money uh, that year that the game came back to New York, and I did it just so I could come here and tell you about it. So here's the way it went down one hot night in August of 1973 on the corner of 6th Avenue and West 3rd Street in New York's Greenwich Village. You ready? It's a simple little game where the cards go round. All you got to see is where the red goes down. Put your green on the red and then I'll see if you're five. Going to make you ten. I'll show you where it is, he said. I'll show you where it's not. Place your bet. See what you got. When I cross my hand, I'm out of fool. Oh, man, I just messed it up at the end. I'm going to have to do it again. All right, one more time. I'll show you where it is, as you said. I'll show you where it's not. Place your bet, see what you got. When I cross my hands, I might have fooled some man. Now, just then, the shill stepped in and threw 20 bucks on this card and lost. And now I knew my moment. I went to throw my money down, but the guy said, no, no, you already seen one card. It changes the odds. I'll only take a $50 bet. And I threw my 50 down. He thought I was going to bet over here, but I knew the money operator had the red card over there. <laughs> now, Thanks. Now, I've seen this game played all around the world. Uh, in London, sometimes they'll put an umbrella, or a big umbrella on the street, play it on the top of the umbrella. Uh, I've seen it played in Paris, where they use uh, a red queen. They call it Cherche la Femme, another game that I've played and lost. <laughs> but one thing that's true all over the world is that the red card, for whatever reason, the black cards are always the loser. Black cards lose, red cards win. Now, we're not going to play for any money here today. Amy, but just to, uh, just a little guess, just, you know, just so you have the feeling, right, of what, it, of what it's like to, uh, to play the game, right? Just take a guess, point to where you think the red card might be, in the middle. Oh, wait. It's Look at, oh, it's bent. No, you gotta be careful with that. Some people could use that to cheat, <laughs> okay? And that's three card money. The only way to play, win is not to play. Thanks a lot, thank you, darling. Give her a big hand for helping out. <laughs> so, that is a brief and I hope entertaining demonstration of the old street con game known as the three card money. Why do people still get taken in by this ancient swindle? H.L. HL Macon said that for every complex problem there's a solution that is neat, plausible, and wrong. And so one simple answer to the question is that there's a secret sleight of hand maneuver, a switch that the operator is using in order to deceive the player. That's a fact, but it's not the answer to the question. Another possible answer is that people are stupid. There's a sucker born every minute, in the words of P.T. Barnum, a man who was describing the folks he thought of as his potential clientele. Now, if my expertise in deception has taught me anything, it's this, that anyone can be fooled, even an expert in deception. All too often, we blame the victims of street side short cons or even a grand Ponzi scheme. But in the relationship of predator to prey, do we give the tiger credit for his powerful muscles, his claws, his fangs, his stealthy approach? Or do we just fault the antelope for being too slow and stupid? If the default position is to blame the victim, then we give no credit to the victimizer, and we fail to credit the con man. So today I want to share some of the real reasons almost everyone can be conned and demonstrate why these answers should be of value and I think great importance to skeptics. Now one answer is that over those 150 years of tossing Monty, the professional con artists have finally honed their skills. And it's hard to imagine without actually seeing it, as I have many, many times on the street, the breathtaking speed and ruthless efficiency of the psychological warfare waged by the Monty mob. The three card Monty is in reality an elaborate theatrical production with multiple actors, each playing a key role in hooking the player not just intellectually, which reduced the game to a more an easily ignored puzzle, but rather emotionally, which turns that little puzzle into a personal drama. The Monty operator is not really an expert in sleight of hand. He might be good at what he does, but he has not a fraction of the skills of even your amateur magician friend who shows you a new card trick, sleight of hand card trick now and then over lunch. But like the professional magician, 
The Monty operator is an expert in deception and psychological manipulation. His game is not just a game of wits, but rather a game of ego. It's not a gamble on the cards, rather it's his bet that he can gain the victim's confidence, that's the origin of the con in con game, and lead him to put his money down on what seems like a sure thing. Now as it happens, I too am a specialist in deception. My skills of deception, psychological, physical, mechanical, are most visibly applied to the creation of entertaining and artistic illusions for the pleasure of my audience. But I'm also deeply interested in many kinds of deception that are far less benign, from con games to cheating and gambling to fraudulent psychic claims and much more. Now my expertise is narrow, but it's deep. As Randy likes to say, we know how to fool people, and we know how to recognize how and when people are being fooled. And I'm going to take on a brief tour of some of these interests now and the lessons I think they hold for skeptics. I've done some work in the field of casino security, and I also present demonstrations and performances of the skills of the card cheats and casino hustlers. And the fact is that among these kinds of gaming cheats, often boldness is the greatest asset the professional hustler possesses. Like most criminals, he doesn't really think he's going to get caught. He's willing to hazard tremendous risk, risks that would seem lunacy to most of us. I've had the chance to view countless hours of eye in the sky video footage from the security cameras. And I can tell you that significant sleight of hand technical skill, although it does exist, and I have occasionally seen it, but in fact, it's a rarity. Most card cheats are just fearless, ham-fisted clowns. <laughs> but, the prof but the professional cheat, who is much more readily found in social games, by the way, rather than in casino games, he must, like the street scam grifter, also gain the confidence of his victors. You know, the guy who comes to your weekly poker game, who never wins really big, but always seems to win eh, steadily and rarely loses much, and, who might also be the friendly, helpful guy who took your wife to the dentist when her car was in the shop or came by to feed the cats, you know? He could also be the perfect guy to be cheating just enough at your game and maybe a half a dozen other regular games you don't know about to be quietly making a very comfortable, steady living at your expense with the help of a few select card cheating moves. And at the casino, it's often the seemingly slow player, the guy who doesn't quite fully know the rules of the game or the apparently drunk player who's getting the dealer's attention while the real mechanic is pulling cards from the bottom or dice switch or whatever at the other end of the table. Again, the psychology is a key part of the secret. Now, I don't want to spend too much time talking about cheating and gambling while we're here in a casino. <laughs> <laughs> and I promise I won't touch the cards in the poker tournament tonight, <laughs> except my own. <laughs> Uh, so let's move on to another kind of scam artist. 88 years after Charles Ponzi created the financial scam that bears his name to today and for which he went to prison twice, Bernard Madoff, better known as Bernie, was arrested on December 7, 2008 for operating the biggest Ponzi scheme in history, having built his victims out of an estimated $65 billion, enough to fund the American war in Afghanistan for a full year. Since pleading guilty in 09, Madoff is currently serving a 150-year sentence, the maximum allowable term for his crimes, although much still remains unknown or is yet not publicly explained about the details of Madoff's crimes. We now believe he was engaged in his systematic thievery since 1991. He was arrested in 2008. How could Bernie Madoff have operated successfully for so long and still have been bringing in new investors, that is, victims, literally within days of his self planned arrest. Recall that the sleight of hand maneuver that switches two cards in the Monty game is a useless device without the psychology, the theater, right? without the emotional confidence the operator instills in the mark. The same was true of Bernie Madoff, whose victims number in the thousands from elderly widows to major international banking institutions. The phony monthly statements that Madoff and his co-conspirators concocted and sent out, printed on dot matrix printers, was part of the trick of Madoff's scam but it's not what made the scam work, any more than the Monty Man's sleight of hand switch. Bernie Madoff's greed and pathology would have gotten him nowhere without the psychology of, in his case, what's known as an affinity scheme, a deadly game that built trust based on tribalism, created desire based on the perception of exclusivity, built confidence with those primitive monthly statements mailed to widows and financial titans alike that detail the stocks and securities they own when, in fact, they own nothing of the sort. Now, Madoff actively solicited business on an ongoing and aggressive basis, making his investments fund seem all the more attractive not only by way of its apparent safety 
and steady, seemingly conservative profitability, but also because of the carefully manufactured and maintained illusion of exclusivity. By turning away the occasional investor with apparent arrogance and disregard, I don't need your money, he was famously known to declare publicly, particularly to prospects with too many questions, Madoff actually helped to build his myth, and by so doing, built the desirability of his fund. Bernie Madoff is a criminal, a con man, a predator, a sociopath, and an expert deceiver who worked hard to maintain his deceptions. Credit the con man. My point is this, that when dealing with professionals, be it a magician, Monty man, or Madoff, it would be a mistake to blame the victim of a card trick, a con game, a billion dollar Ponzi scheme. To blame the victim offers no useful insight and teaches us little about what's actually occurred. Yet in the immediate aftermath of the Madoff affair, there was no shortage of voices ready to blame the victims of Madoff's predations. New York Times business columnist Joe Nocera addressed the Madoff case for the first time on March 13th, 2009, almost three months to the day after Madoff's arrest, with a piece that topped with this headline, Madoff had accomplices, his victims. Six long weeks later, as more and more information was coming out, on June 29th, Nocera still was with that approach. His headline now was, Madoff victims, get over it. Eventually, though, even though Sarah became sympathetic to the victims, as the tragedies of their individual stories became more and more public and horrifying. People losing their entire retirement, people who were expecting comfortable retirement and now couldn't afford medical care, and, more, and, and, and many more like that. So there's two key lessons to be drawn from the Madoff disaster, apart from the failed responsibilities of the SEC and regulators. Lesson one is this, anyone can be fooled. The moment you think you can't, you're lining up to be someone's next victim. And lesson two is that before we blame the victim, we must first and always credit the con man. Now let's talk about something a little closer to home for skeptics, namely psychics and psychic fraud. I recently blogged about an article that appeared in the June 6th edition of the Broward Palm Beach New Times with the headline, How Modern Fortune Tellers Pull Off Their Scams, in which reporter Kyle Swenson recounts detailed and horrifying stories of four devastated victims of fortune-telling scam artists. I, I, I recommend this piece. The victims, all women, include a 27-year-old woman of Indian descent who grew up in England, a married 42-year-old Indian woman with a master's degree in applied economics, not the stereotype of a psychic victim, a divorcee in her early 60s, and a young 19-year-old woman as well. All were experiencing struggles in their lives at the time, were emotionally vulnerable when they exposed themselves to heartless predators ready to take advantage of wounded prey. Again, the emotional component is necessary in order to explain and understand how otherwise rational people can suddenly and unexpectedly become entrapped by professional con artists who possess an arsenal of finely honed tools of psychological manipulation. In the case of the 27-year-old woman, quoting from the article here, quote, in swift succession she had lost her job and her four-year marriage snapped. Then in the course of three years after meeting the psychic, quote, she remortgaged her house, took out loans, barred from the family, close quote, and ended up handing over $140,000 over a three-year period before simply running out of resources. And all the other victims recount similar tales. Now these stories may seem incredible, but they are far from uncommon. Storefront psychics look at every new client as a potential golden goose to bleed drive to bleed dry over the long, brutally patient haul. The only rare aspects of these stories is that these victims went public, and also that the cases were prosecuted. Victims are usually too humiliated to admit such losses. They have difficulty understanding themselves, much less explaining to others how they ever got in so deep and for so long. Florida psychic Rose Marks is set to go to trial next month for her part in an alleged $25 million scam over some 20 years with various targets that included taking romance novelist Jude Devereaux for some claimed $17 million over a 20-year period. And Devereaux hasn't told the details of her story yet, but we know that she experienced the death of her son, eight-year-old son, I think, a divorce, and so on, during that time. Along with the skills of the victimizers, the psychological mechanism known as cognitive dissonance also provides an important part of the answer. Once people make a commitment of belief and of money, they will justify that commitment as being wise and sensible, making it increasingly difficult to face the possibility of having made a terrible mistake. That's why people end up handing over even more money in the hopes and faith that their investment will pay off to justify it. 
<clears throat> in the form of relief from the struggles and pains that sent them seeking help in the first place. It's a vicious cycle that a cold-blooded con artist knows how to skillfully maintain and feed off of. As Carol Tavers, who's spoken here at TAM several times but isn't here this year, as Carol writes in her superb book, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me, quote, the ability to reduce dissonance helps us in countless ways, preserving our beliefs, our confidence, decisions, self-esteem, and well-being. But this ability can get us into big trouble. People will pursue self-destructive courses of action to protect the wisdom of initial decisions, close quote. So as we begin to try and unpack the mystery of how, someone's hands, how someone hands her personal fortune over to a phony psychic, we first have to credit the con man. But then we also have to look at the con man's tools, which in turn are skills of manipulating the workings of human psychology. And that leads you to look at important psychological mechanisms like cognitive dissonance, which is a remarkable phenomenon that thanks to its own workings, few of us really want to admit how much it can influence our own behavior. Now, Michael Shermer, in his excellent book, Why People Believe Weird Things, writes, quote, in my opinion, most believers in miracles, monsters, and mysteries are not hoaxers, flim-flam artists, or lunatics. Most are normal people whose normal thinking has gone wrong in some way. Exactly. So how does that happen? How and why does our thinking so readily go wrong and often so far at that? Well, one potential element, one potent element, I should say, pardon me, is magical thinking. We humans have evolved as pattern-seeking animals, possessing a unique cognitive ability that enables us to draw connections, to learn from experience, to identify cause and effect. We make judgments every day that, in the larger scheme of things, serve us well, particularly when we were social hunter-gatherers on the grasslands of Africa. Shermer writes that, quote, humans evolved the ability to seek and find connections between things and events in the environment Snakes with rattles should be avoided. And those who made the first connections, the best connections, left behind the most offspring. We are their descendants. The problem is that causal thinking is not infallible. We make connections whether they are there or not. Close quote. Magicians thrive on this evolutionarily programmed tendency. Shermer goes on to dub our central processor, this pattern-seeking brain. He calls it the belief engine. And he theorizes that, quote, under certain conditions, it leads to magical thinking. Under different circumstances, it leads to scientific thinking. And he adds that natural selection has resulted in the fact that, quote, the belief engine is a useful mechanism for survival, not just for learning about dangerous and potentially lethal environments, but in reducing anxiety about that environment through magical thinking pointing out that there is, a, there is psychological evidence that magical thinking reduces anxiety in uncertain environments, right? The, 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 the jock, the professional, you know, ball player who's got that lucky charm or that lucky routine, reducing anxiety in uncertain environments. We think magically because we have to think causally. We have magical thinking and superstitions because we need critical thinking and pattern finding. The two cannot be separated. This is still uh, Shermer talking, because we need, uh, sorry, the two cannot be separated. Magical thinking is a necessary byproduct of the evolved mechanism of causal thinking. Believers in UFOs, alien abductions, ESP, psychic phenomena, their thinking has gone wrong, but he adds, optimistically and accurately, that fortunately, there is an abundance of evidence that the belief engine is malleable. Critical thinking can be taught. Skepticism is learnable. Close quote. And <clears throat> And indeed, it has to be learnable, because it's certainly the, not a natural way for humans to think. In an excellent and provocative book published in 1995, Uncommon Sense, The Heretical Nature of Science, by Alan Cromer, the author explained that far from being natural, scientific thinking goes so far against the grain of conventional human thought that if it hadn't been discovered in Greece, it might never have been discovered at all. Cromer presents the argument that science represents a radically new and different way of thinking, a way that is completely unnatural to the biologically evolved species known as Homo sapiens. The entire duration of our species' existence on the Earth is little more than a blink in evolutionary time. When you consider the fact that dinosaurs were here for 350 million years, whereas if you include early, even if you include early hominids like Australopithecines that are not yet human, we've been here, what, a tiny fraction, six, seven million years? And then it's not until the Greeks, just 2,000 years ago, that the scientific method is conceived. And then the era of modern scientific thought and method really dates back to Galileo 400 years ago. And that's not even a blink in geologic time. It's barely measurable. 
and yet it contains most of our significant accomplishments as humans, from discovering the origins of the universe, to the germ theory of disease, to landing men on the moon. As a species, we've only just begun to learn to think scientifically. And as individuals, we each have to learn how. We each have to be taught how. We won't just come to it on our own. Left to our own devices, we're still just magical thinkers trying to survive on the African plains. We could be dancing for rain for another thousand years just because after a long drought, one ended after an evening's dance party. <laughs> now, there's a conventional trope about people supposedly wanting to be seen, though people want to be fooled. I think this is nonsense. Rather, there's, there are aspects of the way our brains evolve that can, as a side effect, lead us to be deceived safely by magicians, dangerously by advertisers and politicians, all but fatally by con men and sociopaths. And there's one more important facet in this mix, and that is the role played by trust. Human beings have evolved to be trusting beings. It makes sense <clears throat> to want to believe people. We've evolved to disbelieve that people are capable of lying directly to our faces, because the alternative an ever-vigilant extreme of caution and protectiveness is contrary to being an effective social animal. A human animal that's constantly wary, relentlessly on guard, quick to protect itself against any risk of deception, would be a very untrusting being. And that's not a being that will find it very easy to develop constructive relationships and function well socially with peers, with colleagues, with family and society, even to organize and engage in group hunting of giant mammals in the Pleistocene era. To do these things, we must be willing to trust despite the associated risks. Now, one important evolutionary protection we have against deceivers is our built-in in-group, out-group programming, which kicks in at a very early age in higher mammals, right after we've learned to recognize immediate family and friends, and then everyone else is an outsider. But that's a sloppy and imprecise sort of generalized hope for the best protection. It doesn't account for individuals who are willing to operate maliciously from within the group. It doesn't protect you from Bernie Madoff who ruthlessly relied upon in-group status to manipulate his victims. And as Carol Tavers has pointed out to me, cognitive dissonance is pre-wired to protect us from the times when we will inevitably be fooled, which typically produces dissonance. How could I have been so stupid? And which we immediately strive to reduce. I wasn't stupid. Let me mortgage my house and give the guy another hundred grand. I'll show you how smart I was. Which people actually did for Madoff. The victim's cognitive dissonance helps the con man in his ongoing predations, while his own dissonance, his own dissonance, helps him think he's not such a bad guy while he's doing it. So I confess I think it's foolish to talk about people's desire to be deceived. Just as any of us can be fooled, all of us engage in self-deception as well. But ultimately, it's for a higher purpose, for the benefits it delivers us in dealing with ourselves, with other people, and the inherent dissonance of this world. Nobody wants to be fooled, except at the magic show, but fooled we all shall be, and it cannot happen without trust. And the ability to trust, even when the cost means being occasionally victimized, is central and essential in human life and society. So sure, try not to be fooled, but don't be so hard on yourself when it does happen. So what's my message today? Well, some who've been around the skeptic block for a while might think this is Jamie's don't be a dick speech. <laughs> not so. I believe in calling bullshit on bullshit. I don't believe in so-called framing. I believe you should tell the truth as you see it. I believe there's room for every conceivable way of communicating skepticism, and I do not believe there is any one right way. I believe in the soft sell for some and the hard sell for others. I believe in persuasion as well as polemics. I believe we need warriors as well as diplomats. And if you don't think James Randi spent his career as a warrior, you haven't been paying attention for the last 40 years. But, in my experience, Randy has always been empathic towards victims and believers and even shut-eyes. He's unfailingly polite to those elements that we as skeptics so often encounter. He saved his warrior weapons not for the victims, but for the victimizers. And that's an important difference. I guess what I want to say here is that the difference between a tobacco company and a smoker. Tobacco companies willfully concealed and distorted scientific information in order to promote their profits and poison. They deserve to be called out, challenged, prosecuted in every conceivable manner. So to me, before you focus your laser sight and put your finger on the verbal trigger, I just ask that you pause and ask yourself, am I talking to a smoker or to a tobacco company, to a victim or a victimizer? James McCormick, whose company ATSC manufactured the phony bomb detection technology, warranted prosecution and its 10-year prison sentence, thanks partly to the work of James Randi, who was the first public voice to call attention to that deadly fraud. 
James Van Prague, John Edwards, Sylvia Brown, and their ilk deserve our scorn and our confrontations. The manufacturers of homeopathic remedies warrant our debunkings and our demonstrations. But those who fall prey to these skilled and powerful and well-financed predators deserve not just the facts as we know them, but also our empathy. It does no one any good to label those victims of psychic fraud as merely stupid or gullible. It doesn't help them. It doesn't help protect their next potential victim. And isn't that our true goal as skeptics? Now, thank you. Now, is there a clear dividing line? No, there isn't. As skeptics, we confront issues that are complex and as messy as the spectrum of human behavior itself. When a homeopathy user becomes a debater or a promoter, active promoter of the useless product he wastes his money on, what's the best response? I don't pretend to always know, but for us as skeptics, the simple fact that we're right, or even that the science is on our side, is not enough to change anyone's mind, much less to change the world. Speaking purely for myself, I don't generally debate these issues with individual consumers or believers. I'll state the science in brief and simple terms, offer an informative reference or a useful book title, and then move on. What's the point of an argument? I know how cognitive dissonance works. I don't have a magic set of wire cutters that's going to let me go in and disarm that circuit board in our heads. I'm fighting millions, years, millions of years of evolution. Does all this sound messy, unclear? Wait, it gets worse. What if I told you that even Sylvia Brown and John Edward and James Von Prague might actually believe that they have some psychic ability, and more significantly believe that no matter what their techniques and methods might be, even if deliberately deceptive, nonetheless they think they're actually helping people. Well, the fact of the matter is, uh, by the way, as I talk about my, just in my brand new Honest Liar video that just went up uh, on YouTube that was posted this week, no real life villain ever looks in the mirror and declares, mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the most villainous villain of all? Tis I, tis I, tis I. <laughs> <sighs> the truth is far more complicated because that scene only happens in the movies. And it happens in the movies because it simplifies the story. It simplifies our world. It actually gives us hope that we can be safe from monsters because they're so obvious and brilliant in their evil. But in fact, Hannibal Lecter is scary in a fun kind of way because he's also a comforting fiction. The terrifying reality lies in the banality of evil as brought to life in pathetic losers like Son of Sam killer David Berkowitz or Mark David Chapman who murdered John Lennon. But the messy part of all this means that while we can speculate on the mindset of professional Greek vampires like Sylvia Brown or spoonbender turned motivational speaker Yuri Geller, we can't really know for certain what's in their minds and hearts. And so we must first make our moral decisions purely by judging their behavior, not their imagined or theorized intentions. I believe that professional mediums hurt people, prey on their victims' vulnerabilities, and worsen their lives. And if the selective feedback they get from their supporters, along with the psychological workings of cognitive dissonance, means that they believe their own bullshit, I don't care. I don't care if tobacco executives or homeopathic remedy dealers believe their own bad thinking and bad science. They all deserve to be called out for making the world a worse place and damaging people's lives. But what does that tell us about how to talk to the intermediary, the guy who sells homeopathic remedies and thinks they work? Isn't he responsible? Shouldn't he be called out and confronted? How do we talk to the believer, the consumer, or the shut-eye, dyed-in-the-wool loyalist? Do we simply show them our sympathy and nothing else and keep quiet? Good question. What am I, Yoda? <laughs> I don't know. What I'm saying is pick your battles and try and distinguish between victimizers and victims and try to understand how the victim got that way. And drawing again from Carol Tavris on cognitive dissonance, she cautions that, quote, the unbending need to be right inevitably produces self-righteousness. When confidence and convictions are unleavened by humility, by an acceptance of fallibility, people can easily cross the line from healthy self-assurance to arrogance, close quote. And that's a worthwhile cautionary notice for every skeptic. So putting tactics aside now, whether you're inclined towards confrontation, condemnation, consideration, or conciliation, my real message today is about what skeptics need to know.
Scientific skepticism is about educating and informing the public, about promoting science and critical thinking and advocating the scientific worldview, and also about debunking for purposes of educating and also to confront fraud and serve as consumer advocates and protectors. These are the core purposes of scientific skepticism, as we discussed on the panel yesterday. But before we can educate others, we must also educate ourselves. And every skeptic who thinks the explanation of a successful psychic scam or crackpot alternative medicine pitch is to just declare another sucker getting what he deserves for his stupidity is wrong. That doesn't just reveal a lack of empathy. More significantly, it reveals a lack of expertise. It's easy to understand that transcendental meditation will never teach people to float because we understand physics and biology, but it's not so easy to understand why people give up their lives to a dangerous cult and think that bouncing on their buttocks is a transitional step to human flight. <laughs> if you want to talk to people about getting conned, then it's your responsibility to inform yourself about why people get conned. The literature is out there, it's excellent, it makes for great and provocative reading. I just reread Michael Shermer's Why People Believe uh, Weird Things. It's a basic text for skeptics. Uh, it's a basic text for living life as a human being and trying to navigate the hazards of the world. You should, uh, Demon, Carl Sagan's Demon Haunted World as, as great a fundamental text, if you will, that skeptics could possibly have. If you haven't read it, you should. If you, if you haven't read Carol Tavis's Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me, or you haven't read up on the phenomenon of how cognitive dissonance works, you'll never understand why people insist on tossing good money after bad, whether it's to a storefront psychic, a street side scam artist, or the Bernie Madoffs of the world. Some years ago, a friend of mine, a professional, vic a professional magician, fell victim to a con right in the heart of New York City, no less. The con man did not prey on my friend's greed, he preyed on his kindness with an ancient scam called the Pigeon Drop, actually a variation called the Jamaican Tourist. If you ask me in the bar tonight, well, I'll tell you the story in more detail. It's quite amazing. It, the con man preyed on my friend's morality, on his empathy and desire to help a person who was apparently in trouble. My magician friend got taken for the contents of his wallet that day, but is he just another sucker, another idiot who deserves what he got? Or should we be grateful for people like him on the planet? People whose compassion for a stranger in trouble ends up costing them some cash. We give money to the homeless because of our humanity. And if there's a risk that once in a while we're filling the cup of a man who's, not only, who's only pretending to be blind, but is actually watching us drop a dollar in, how bad is that really? Consider the alternative. The theme of our conference this year is fighting the fakers. Blaming victims gets us nowhere in that fight. And even fighting fakers gets us nowhere without an understanding of how and why their schemes actually work. So don't blame the victim. Credit the con man, credit magical thinking, credit cognitive dissonance, and the desire to see ourselves as smart, kind, and compassionate. None of us is immune to these forces. And before you harshly judge a victim of a psychic scam or a pseudoscientific alternative medicine claim, remember the magician's most important lesson. Everyone can be fooled. Thanks a lot. Jamie E. in Swiss, ladies and gentlemen. Excellent.